Uh, thank you very much. Could I first express my great thanks uh, to uh, Bogdan and his colleagues and the other people who have organised this really very interesting event. I think I've launched a book or two or three, but never before a stamp, so that was, uh, that was the first. <clears throat> I, I bring you greetings from the President of the International Court of Justice, His Excellency Judge Peter Tomka. He greatly regrets that he cannot be here. Along with other members of the court, President Tomka is encouraged by the indications that Romania will soon file a declaration accepting the compulsory jurisdiction of the court under Article 36, Paragraph 2 of, the, of its statute. Uh, that indication was further reinforced by the Minister just a few minutes ago this morning. In that context, members of the court were very pleased to read what Mrs. Alina Arasan, Director for International Law and Treaties of your Ministry of Foreign Affairs, said in the General Assembly of the United Nations last year, following the presentation by Judge Tomka of the Court's annual report. She recalled, as has the Minister, the conferences that were held here uh, and on the compulsory jurisdiction of the Court, and she again thanked President Tomka for participating in one of them. She said this, the public discussion generally evinced support for the initiative of accepting the compulsory jurisdiction of the court, an approach shared by Romanian authorities, the specialists in the fields of international law, and the general public. We can thus envisage that soon Romania will join the group of countries which have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. If I might briefly put aside my international hat and put on my national one, I note that the Speaker immediately before her encouraged member states who have, who have not yet accepted the Court's jurisdiction by depositing that declaration of acceptance to do so. That Speaker was the permanent representative of New Zealand, a country which first accepted the jurisdiction of the Court over 80 years ago and has maintained that acceptance ever since. And it is very encouraging, if I may mention it again, to hear the Minister speaking of Romania's rich attachment to international law and to the kind of things that he said at that rule of law high-level summit uh, in New York just a little while back. This morning I will address two matters. The first, in a general way, the judgment in the Black Sea case and the second, more specifically, the advisory jurisdiction of the court. My comments on the judgment will be general because I have taken the view, my secretary typed that as vow, and maybe I should use the word vow, uh, will be general because I have taken the vow since I first became a judge now over 30 years ago that I will not speak in any specific way about judgments in which I have been involved. So far as I am concerned, the judgments must speak for themselves, for better or for worse. I do, however, have three reflections on the Black Sea case. The first is to recall that the, that the court, including the two judges at ad hoc, one of whom is here this morning, was unanimous and that there was no separate opinion or declaration. I still remember the note of joy in the voice of President Rosalind Higgins as she announced that fact in what were almost her last words as President uh, as delivered from the bench in the Great Hall of Justice in the Peace Palace. I also recall a very, very large smile on the face of Professor Alain Pillay at that moment because it was a first. The choice of the two ad hoc judges helps make another point and it is not that the court had two French judges and two judges of American nationality, although that was a first as well. More significant for me was that both the ad hoc judges were, and indeed are, real experts on the law of the sea. Uh, Judge Oxman demonstrated that most recently in a ruling um, which was given within four days, says something about the speed of international justice sometimes, a ruling which was given within four days on a challenge by the Russian Federation to a decision of the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Commission. Uh, and Judge Cott, at the moment, 
as the CB indicates, CB in your materials indicates, is heavily involved in law of the sea matters. States before the court no doubt consider the different qualities and competencies of those they might appoint as judges ad hoc, helped in that by their public record over the past decades. A prior question, of course, is whether they should appoint a judge ad hoc, a matter on which there are different views. I should also stress that judges ad hoc are installed as full members of the court. They make a solemn declaration and they have equal rights and responsibilities with the other members of the court. My second reflection relates to the law applied in the Black Sea case and applied and developed in many other cases decided over the past four decades. That law has also been developed, uh, clarified, applied through practice going back even further and through major multilateral lawmaking efforts since the 1950s. In 1969, the court in the North Sea Continental Shelf cases rejected the argument based on the 1958 Continental Shelf Convention that customary international law contained a rule requiring an equidistance method of delimitation. Rather, the court called for the application of equitable principles. It set out three ideas in very broad terms. It declared that more than one method might be used concurrently, and it stated that there was no limit to the circumstances that might be taken into account and that they might be given different weights. I remember thinking in 1969 that the law stated in those terms seemed very indefinite. How could a judge ever apply it, I thought? especially how could a 15 or 17 judge court ever apply it. But since then the law has been developed and clarified in fascinating ways. Among those ways are 20 or more judgments and awards of the court, of ad hoc tribunals and of the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. I have been a member of the court in four of those cases most recently, exactly a week ago, in the case decided between Peru and Chile. In that case, the court proceeded on the basis of customary international law, as reflected in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Citing the Black Sea case, among others, it set out the three-step methodology which it usually applies in seeking an equitable solution. It applied that methodology, noting, however, the difficulty, even the impossibility, of undertaking the proportionality calculation often involved in the third phase. It is striking looking back at how all the processes have, have led to a consolidated body of law, practice and procedure. That body of law now is fairly routinely applied by states in negotiating their boundary settlements. They don't always have to come to the point of arbitration or adjudication. But of course, as your case shows, sometimes that is necessary. So my third reflection arising from the judgment of five years ago and those other cases in practice is to emphasise the role of principle. I'm not here talking about general principle. I'm not talking about general principles of law recognised by civilised nations to quote the 1920 language still in the statute of the court. I'm talking about principle, and that is to be found not just in international law, but also in national law, in law generally. I now turn to my second area, the advisory jurisdiction of the court, and here I will continue with my emphasis on principle. 50 years ago, if you can imagine that far back, a very young law teacher in Wellington, New Zealand, was preparing a thesis on the advisory jurisdiction of the International Court. He went to the Hague Recur, the collection of lectures given um, in the Hague at the Hague Academy in the Peace Palace grounds, uh, and one of them was a, an important set of lectures given in 1936 by a distinguished son of Romania, Judge Dimitri Negulescu a long-time judge of the Permanent Court of International Justice. It is a personal pleasure for me to be able, in the city of his birth, to pay tribute to him and to his memory. 
I recall the event um, in the Peace Palace and there were other events as well in The Hague in his memory in 2006. If you go back to that thesis, um, written all those years ago, you'll find that there were nine um, secondary sources primarily cited. The third of them was Nigalescu's thesis, uh, lectures. He was exceeded in citations only by Manley Hudson, uh, Judge Manley Hudson, the great expert on the Permanent Court of International Justice, and Shabtai Rosen. I'm here talking of books published in the 1940s and 50s, so those books were somewhat more recent than the 1936 lectures. According to Judge Negolescu, advisory opinions of the court fell into two categories, those with no connection to a particular dispute and those where an international dispute already existed. Um, he helped develop um, and apply that distinction between those two categories in the practice and rules of the court. Uh, Judge Nicolescu also made a major contribution to a 1930 resolution of the Institut de Droit International, of, for which he was one of two rapporteurs. Now let me run through five points of principle relating to the advisory jurisdiction of the court before I end with another reference to Judge Nicolescu. The first point of principle is one that would deny the existence of such a jurisdiction. The point of principle is that courts decide. They do not advise. They decide in a binding way. In the case of international courts, they decide disputes between states. So it was said at the outset in the early 1920s by very distinguished American lawyers that the advisory jurisdiction was obviously not a judicial function. It was a violation of all judicial procedures. They now, no doubt had in mind an early ruling of their Supreme Court uh, to that effect when it refused to give advice to a president. But the court and its predecessor have from the outset over the past 90 years exercised that jurisdiction in a very wide range of cases. To come to my second point of principle, they have insisted from the outset that in giving advisory opinions, they cannot depart from the essential rules guiding their activity as a court. The court is bound, it said, as early as 1923, to remain faithful to its judicial character. That means, in practical terms, that the court has largely assimilated the procedure it follows in advisory cases to the procedure it follows in contentious cases between states. The court is guided here by Article 68 of the Statute of the Present Court, which building on the practice, the practice of Judge Nicolescu and his colleagues, um, became part of the Statute of the Permanent Court in 1936. That provision uh, says to the court, you are to apply the rules applicable in contentious cases to advisory proceedings to the extent appropriate. This is not the occasion to run through all the detail of that assimilation. That detail relates to notice to those states and other bodies affected, to the publicity of the proceedings, to written and oral proceedings, uh, to the right to participate in the proceedings, an issue which has arisen in the last three case advisory cases before the court relating to the wall in occupied Palestine, to Kosovo and to the uh, International Fund for, for Agricultural Development opinion recently. Another detail is judges ad hoc uh, and a reasoned opinion delivered in public. So extensive assimilation. I do call attention to one point of detail, again giving rise to matters of principle uh, in the most recent case, that IFAD case. In that case, the court was faced with an employment dispute between an individual and a specialised agency. In that opinion, the court emphasised a central aspect of the good administration of justice. The principle, to take that word again, again without general, again without of national systems or international systems, the principle of equality before the courts, of parties before it. There were two aspects of the dispute resolution procedure in that case which concerned the court. 
The first was that only the employer, only the United Nations Agency, had access to the court. Only it could initiate the process and not the individual. Uh, the court commented that such a limitation on the right to initiate process may not meet the principle of equality of access to courts and tribunals as, as it is now understood. In that context, the court took account of developing views of the principle of equality before courts and tribunals, as seen, for instance, in the work of the Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which showed how that principle had moved on. Now, the court could do nothing to ameliorate that particular problem, but it did take steps to ensure that equality of access applied in the proceedings actually before it. It gave the former employee equal opportunities to present her argument in writing, to present her evidence, and to answer the arguments presented by the agency. What, to come to a third matter of the principle that's only, that states are subject to the jurisdiction of international courts and tribunals only if they have consented. The court has consistently taken the position in a number of cases, including at least three on my count in which Romania has raised this argument, that that lack of consent does not defeat its advisory jurisdiction. That position was also taken by Judge Nicolescu and by that young New Zealander all those years ago. That lack of consent might be relevant to the exercise by the court of its discretion, whether or not to give the opinion, but it does not go to jurisdiction. A fourth point which bears on that discretion arises from the status of the court. It is not just a judicial body, it is also a principal organ, an organ, a principal organ of the United Nations. Early in its existence, in two advisory opinions in which Romania was involved, the court declared that its reply to a request for an advisory opinion represented its participation in the activities of the United Nations, and in principle, no request should be refused. Later on, it said compelling reasons had to be present. Uh, to, uh, to require the court not to answer. In fact, the court has never exercised its discretion to refuse a request, although in the Kosovo case, in which um, Mr. Aurescu and Mr. Donescu appeared for Romania, where the request was made by the General Assembly, five of the 14 judges sitting in that case thought it should refuse to give an answer on the basis that the question should have come from the Security Council and not from the General Assembly. The court, however, took the position presented by Mr. Aurescu, and that must be the better position, that it should answer the question posed. My fifth and final point of principle concerns the matter of the redrafting of the question submitted to the court. Whether this is more a matter of practice than of principle, it is, if I may quote, one of the greatest international lawyers of the last century, a matter of common experience that a mere affirmation or a mere denial of a question does not necessarily result in a close approximation to truth. Judge Lauderpart went on to suggest in that case that the court enjoys a considerable latitude in constructing the question or in, or form, in formulating the answer in such a way as to make its advisory function effective and useful. And in fact, the court has redrafted questions in many cases, including in the Kosovo case, where the redrafting has attracted some criticism. Now, I conclude, as I promised, with your judge, Negolescu, and in particular with the work of the Institut de Droit International, in which he played a central role over 75 years ago. The relevant resolution was adopted in 1937 when the Permanent Court of International Justice had already given the last of its 28 advisory opinions, a figure which the present court has still to reach in a period four times as long. The resolution noted first that the advisory procedure, surrounded by the guarantees of judicial procedure, contributes to the formation and development of international law, and second, that the advisory process where compulsory jurisdiction was not available, 
could provide a greater service to the peaceful settlement of international disputes. The ANSTI II expressed the view first that when states do not consider it possible to, dis to submit their disputes to contentious proceedings, they could ask the Council of the League to seek an opinion from the court. And the Institute second expressed the view that treaties not providing for the court's jurisdiction ought to include a provision enabling a state to ask the council to request an opinion. Such ideas have been raised from time to time in recent years, but not in any systematic way. As the record shows, while the court now is very busy with contentious cases, requests for opinions are much less frequent than they were during the life of the permanent court, and indeed in the first 15 years of the present court. If I might be allowed a suggestion, Mr Chairman, as I conclude, it might be whether once Romania has made its declaration under Article 36, para Paragraph 2 of the Statute of the Court, those interested might return to the matter of advisory jurisdiction, a jurisdiction with which, um, as today's programme shows, and as the Minister in opening this conference um, mentions, and as the lists on the wall show, Romania has a great deal of experience. There, there is also now the related experience of ITLOS, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and over a longer period of many national courts uh, in continental Europe in particular, in the Supreme Court of Canada, taking a different view from the United States Supreme Court, and even thinking of one of the jurisdictions you mentioned in passing, Mr, Mr. Chairman, the um, Cook Islands Court of Appeal. Um, now, what does all that jurisdiction, what does all that experience tell us about the value of advice of the advisory jurisdiction? Uh, were the critics of 90 years ago right in condemning that jurisdiction, or does history show that it can have real value? I would like to think that a negative answer would not be attractive to Judge Negalescu nor is it to me either, 50 years after I first benefited from uh, that, uh, those great lectures. I wish you well uh, with this conference and in particular with your further deliberations and action in respect of the acceptance of the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. Thank you very much.